I am Tamara Knopper. I am a sociologist, um, but don't hold that against me. And I am so excited to be here. Uh, let's not do introductions because people can look it up and let's just get all the ball rolling, okay? Um, Hannah, can we have the next slide, please? Thank you so much, right? So the topics we're gonna look at today is kind of, you know, what is the prison industrial complex and prison nation? So we're gonna have some, um, you know, kind of key terms to kind of get us to understand what people are talking about when we talk about abolition. We're then gonna think about abolition democracy um, and W.E.B. Du Bois's influence. And we're gonna think about what does it mean to say that abolition is presence and absence? And I'm going to go through a couple of examples um, the Black Panther Party, Young Lords, and the National Welfare Rights Organization that I think give us some things to think about that are relevant to abolition um, as absence and presence and also to the debates about defund. Then we're going to think about this question about what does it mean to say defund the police is the floor, right? That it's not the horizon, it's the political floor. And so in the process, we're going to learn about kind of, you know, what does it mean to kind of talk about defund, but also what is involved in defunding the police if we think about it as the floor and not the horizon. And in the process, we're going to talk a little bit about police budgets. Then we're going to move to modern monetary theory and the deficit myth. And so we're going to talk about what is monetary policy versus fiscal policy. And we're going to think about two major aspects of the deficit myth, um, such as, you know, um, the idea that we rely on kind of tax paying taxpayers or that the government doesn't have enough money, right? And we're going to be thinking about, um, you know, what does that mean and how to challenge that and what is the relevance for um, abolition and for defund. We're also going to think about, though, the role of political struggle. Um, if we have a better understanding of kind of how our monetary system works and our fiscal policy system works, what are political struggles we still have to kind of think about? And so in the process, we're going to learn a little bit about the CARES Act and the ARPA and the um, relevance to that, to the conversations around defund the police. And then we're going to get into this conversation about abolition and labor. Um, this is where I want to kind of explore what I see as an important kind of part of the political conversation is labor, the work of abolition and the work of presence. And in the process, I'm going to kind of critically engage the kind of leftist claim among some leftists. Not all leftists are the same, I know, right? But the leftist claim among some leftists that uh, police are not workers. I'm actually going to push back against that, but I'm going to argue that we actually have to just start being more explicit that they're violence workers and that part of um, kind of determining the society we want in the political horizon is thinking about the kind of work that we want in that society and what is the work that that work does, right? And then we're gonna end with this conversation about care work, okay? Now, before we go to the next slide, I just wanna say very quickly that, you know, um, about 25 years ago, I was watching C-SPAN and it was the first time I had ever been introduced to this idea of abolition even as a possibility. It was Angela Davis at a conference and she was talking about prison abolition. And I was a little bit familiar with Angela Davis at that time, having read an essay of hers and have seen her in documentaries like Eyes on the Prize. But I really didn't understand her political significance to, um, you know, uh, prison work and around prison organizing. And I also had never heard of prison abolition. It was such a foreign idea to me. Um, and then years later, a good friend of mine and one of my favorite writers in the world, Kenyon Farrow, was the Southern Regional um, uh, uh, Coordinator for Critical Resistance, um, and which is a you know a prison industrial complex abolition organization. And listening to him kind of talk about some of his organizing campaigns in different Southern states and working with um, impacted communities and people who had loved ones who were incarcerated, it was probably the first time when I look back that I was actually introduced to kind of you know, working towards abolition in terms of kind of community organizing and building relationships and working with impacted communities. Um, and so I'm just very grateful for that. And, you know, I don't totally remember when I was introduced to modern monetary theory, 
There are two people that I would like to thank for help with this presentation in terms of thinking through some of the stuff, um, Raul Carrillo and also Rohan Gray. Um, and I don't know when I got on their radars, but I'm just very, very grateful. And I was invited to present at the third annual Modern Monetary Conference, um, Modern Monetary Theory Conference a few years ago. And the reason I'm just very grateful to have been introduced to abolition and to MMT is I feel like both kind of really push us to kind of, you know, expand our demands and to know that we deserve to have more, you know, um, uh, uh, bigger political imaginations and bigger political demands and to really kind of cut through a lot of the smoke and mirrors that's directed at us when we're trying to kind of build that world. And so I see these kind of connections between the two. And when I was invited um, to give this presentation um, and they said, would you like to give a, you know, a, a, a keynote on MMT? I said, yes, and this is the topic I want. And I've been thinking about these things kind of together um, for a bit. And I'm just very, very grateful to be able to be here, um, to be able to kind of uh, uh, bring this conversation um, that's been in my head to the rest of you. And I'm not inventing the conversation, but it's something I just am so just very grateful to be here. So thank you so much. Um, so. Hannah, could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So the first term that I want us to kind of think about is the term prison industrial complex. And this is the definition that Critical Resistance, the organization I had mentioned that my friend Kenyon Farrow worked at, um, uh, this is the definition that they use. And Critical Resistance is an abolitionist organization that recently celebrated, I believe it's 30th anniversary. And years ago, um, about 20 years ago, actually, I was at my friend's apartment and he had this poster and it said, you know, abolish prisons, da, 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 INS, which at that time would have been basically, you know, ICE, right? Um, and it was, you know, this idea of kind of like, what does this mean, right? And critical resistance says the term we use to describe the overlapping interest of government and industry, they use surveillance, policing, and imprisonment as solutions to economic, social, and political problems. Okay, Hannah, next slide, please. So now one of the things I just wanna kind of point out is that this is, I thought, a really important point that Ruth Wilson Gilmore and Craig Gilmore in a co-authored piece wrote about, and they talked about how the term prison industrial complex is not reducible to profit making. And I think this is important because what has happened today is a lot of times people think about kind of for-profit prisons or they'll say, well, the problem is, is that people are making a profit off of this stuff, right? Yes, that's important to kind of emphasize, but one of the things about abolition is policing and prisons itself is a problem, regardless of if it makes a profit or not, right? And, um, and so one of the things that they say is that the term prison industrial complex has, quote, yet to become a broadly useful tool in mobilizing opposition to the complex's continued expansion. And they say, you know, and this is, you know, why I think these type of conversations that we're having tonight are necessary, is that there's a lot of room for kind of debate and kind of, you know, critical exploration among people who already identify as abolitionists, right? A lot of times it's posed as kind of abolitionists and, you know, versus everybody else, but really there's a lot of internal debates among abolitionists that we're going to explore tonight. And so one of the things they point out is we must note that the hollowing out of the term and the skewed political vision thus implied has often come from those who use the term with the most enthusiasm. Along the way, the meaning of industrial shrank to profit and the state disappeared behind the specter of a moral gain. In this view, the outcome of capitalist activity stands in for the complicated relationships that enable or change that outcome. This low flying economism misses some key facts about where we are now. Um, and so that's just something I want to raise about kind of what we should remember about this term prison industrial complex or the PIC, as you'll see people sometimes refer to it. Hannah? So this is Dr. Beth Ritchie, and she has the book Arrested Justice, Black Women Violence in America's Prison Nation. And her concept of prison nation is she talks about it as both incarceration in literal sense but also the kind of ideology and policy 
that uses criminalization and punishment, which doesn't always involve incarceration, as response to the social problems. And I apologize, I think some of my screen, because it like got changed, I don't know what's going on with um, the stuff regarding why, like, here we go, okay. So, um, can everyone see the full screen now? Okay, never mind. Anyways, one of the things I'm gonna point out is some of the words are cut off on the screen, but we're gonna roll with it, okay? Because I'm just so happy to be screen sharing <laughs> through Hannah, so thank you. Um, and so, criminalization punishment, which doesn't always involve incarceration as responses to social problems. And it uses arm of law for social control, especially against oppressed groups, right? And so one of the things is, is that the prison industrial complex is not just about abolishing prisons, even though that is a key part of it. And it's not just about abolishing incarceration, even though that's a key part of it. It's also about challenging policing and criminalization for how we deal with kind of issues that we really might genuinely want to deal with, right? Hannah? Thank you. So W.E.B. Du Bois and Abolition Democracy, right? So this is, you know, a book that he got, had published in 1935. Um, you know, you're getting, you see a lot of attention to it today in some of these debates. Um, it was a book that he spent about like decades, you know, working towards the arguments, especially against the Dunning School of History. Um, and he said, you know, in the end, the book can't be ignored. And that is true. Right, so keep working. You know, best revenge is your paper. Right, and one of the things is, is he talked about, you know, with abolition democracy, he talked about how the abolition of slavery meant not simply the legal end. Of, excuse me, the abolition of slavery meant not simply the end of legal ownership of the slave. It meant the uplift of slaves and their eventual incorporation into the body, civil, politic and social of the United States, right? And so when we think about kind of this idea of abolition, not just as kind of absence, getting rid of uh, violent structures, getting rid of slavery in this case, right? Um, but also abolition as presence. And in his book, he talks a lot about kind of abolition democracy in terms of how it operated and also kind of the different political factions and struggles, right? Um, Hannah? Okay, so one of the things is, is that this is, you know, uh, Dr. Toni Morrison, and even though she wasn't talking about abolition democracy, one of the things that she raises that I think is really important in terms of kind of this political struggle for presence, right, is that, you know, she says no policy decision could ever, it could be understood without dealing with, you know, Black people at the center of the conversation. And she said, even when Black people are not mentioned, you know, debates about housing, debates about education, military economy, voting, citizenship, prisons, loan practices, healthcare, right? She said, really at the heart of these conversations are what should we do with black people? And so if we think about kind of reconstruction, right? After the civil war, I find Dr. Morrison's point really kind of, you know, um, uh, relevant, right? Um, you know, this country really had this question about what do we do with all these formerly enslaved black people. And a lot of the political you know, uh, debates about the public social welfare state and about so the social welfare state, about what should be public goods and about what the government owes people, right? And what should be our rights are really grounded in these debates about black people and also very much grounded in anti-blackness, right? Even as you know, everyone is affected obviously by the way these policy decisions are made, right? Hannah? Okay, so this is Dr. Angela Y. Davis on abolition democracy. And I already mentioned um, kind of her influence on me. And one of the things is, is that she talked about you know, this she's talking about kind of uh, absence and presence, right? And that basically, you know, you can't just simply kind of abolish slavery. Um, you also, along with that, have to kind of create a new society and different institutions for people to um, basically, um, uh, you know, be able to kind of live freely and live, you know, under humane conditions, right? 
Um, and so one of the things she also says is that abolition is not simply directed at carceral institutions, but also other types of institutions where carcerality impacts them, right? And so our schools, our healthcare system, and our housing, right? So Hannah, if you want to go through the next couple slides, we can do this kind of quickly because I just want to show you some examples here, please. So this is the network of advanced abolition, network for the advancement of abolition social work. I'm sorry, I'm a little thrown off. I'll be honest because half my screen, like I, I don't know if y'all can see, but like, you know, half a lot of the words are like, is this is what I want to ask y'all. Can y'all see all the words on the screen or is it cut off on your screen just like mine? That's a genuine question. Can someone put that in the chat? Alas, no, you can't see all the words, right? Okay, so we're in this together, y'all. Hey, okay, all right, so. I won't be able to kind of um, read all the things on the screen. And I apologize for that because I worked really hard on that part of this stuff, right? Okay, so this is the Network of Advanced Abolition, um, Network for the Advancement of the Abolition of Social Work, right? And so this is an organization that's really kind of, you know, pushing to think about how to make social work less, you know, carceral and to not be used for carceral purposes, right? Um, thank you so much, Julia. That's so nice. Thank you, Meredith. Okay. Thank you, Robin. All right, Hannah, would you mind, um, next slide, please? So this is a very powerful term called the treatment industrial complex. And I recommend this study for anybody who has not read it. And thank you, Raul. And um, one of the things is, is that they're looking at the role of kind of um, as we're having reforms and more people are, you know, encouraging people to be released, right, to end so-called mass incarceration, right? What is happening is um, a lot of these kind of companies that have invested in prisons are now investing in kind of treatment services for people post-release who are often on, you know, probation or community supervision, right? And so this is something where, you know, part of what we want is to decarcerate um, kind of treatment services, right? Because treatment services are really important, especially for people who are um, uh, being released from prison. We want them to be released from prison and we want them to get the needed services they might want and need, but not to have it tied up to carcerality and so forth. Hannah? So this is a report from the ACLU, and one of the things it talks about is just, you know, it's a, a really useful study for those who haven't seen it, um, but it talks about just the sheer number of kind of cops or school resource officers, which is a euphemism for cops, um, in uh, schools, in, um, you know, uh, K through 12 schools, and just the lack of kind of counselors or social workers. But if we think back to kind of the organizations that are trying to decarcerate and also um, have abolitionist social work, right, is we could always say, hey, let's get more counselors, social workers, but that doesn't mean that there's not still a relationship then to carcerality, okay? Hannah? This is a group called Survive and Punish. One of the things is, is that we need services and we need support for people who are victims of domestic violence or intimate partner violence. Most people who are harmed physically um, or sexually will be harmed by somebody that they know and are likely to have had some type of relationship with, um, whether it is a family member or whether it is an intimate partner. Right. And so, you know, one of the things is, is how do we kind of decriminalize survival and how do we also decriminalize or decarcerate, um, you know, uh, the um, services or the way that people can deal with domestic violence. One of the things I just want to point out about Kimberly Crenshaw's intersectionality theory was her law article um, dealt mainly with gendered and domestic violence that women of color were experiencing. And she was thinking about intersectionality in relationship to what is the way that they um, are violated by the state when they seek, when they try to seek, um, you know, support to be able to get out of gendered and domestic violence in their relationships, right? And I think that's a part of her intersectionality theorizing that doesn't always get some of the attention in some of the battles about kind of, you know, intersectionality, right? Um, but that's an important part of thinking about abolition, right? Um, next, next, uh, please. 
So this is Dr. Uh, Dorothy Roberts, uh, Professor Roberts, who is a law professor, and this is her new book, Torn Apart. And it's about, you know, family services, which she calls family policing system. And she has moved to an abolitionist position, and she's talking about what does it mean to try to kind of, you know, ensure children's safety, right? Because there are cases where children are being harmed, right, in um, their families or in their households. So she recognizes the need to keep children safe, but she's also thinking about how do we rebuild um, you know, completely dismantle the child welfare system while rebuilding kind of, you know, a model or an institution of how to keep uh, children safe and how to kind of allow families, right, to kind of, um, you know, um, work to keep children safe, right? Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so this is Dr. Ruth Wilson Gilmore, right? And she says, okay, see, so this works. Now I can read the whole thing because I got, I like this. All right. Abolition isn't just absence. As W.E.B. Du Bois showed in Black Reconstruction in America, abolition is a fleshly and material presence of social life lived differently. Abolition is figuring out how to work with people to make something rather than figuring out how to erase something. I've mentioned Du Bois. He shows in exhaustive detail both how slavery ended through the actions of or, and organized activity of the slaves, no less than the Union Army. But also, since slavery ending one day doesn't tell you anything about the next day, Du Bois set out to show what the next day and days here, thereafter looked like during the revolutionary period of radical reconstruction. So abolition is a theory of change. It's a theory of social life. It's about making things. Right. Next slide, please. Okay, so I want to just go quickly through some examples of groups that I see as being kind of part of this abolitionist tradition of, you know, making things as well as trying to prevent, um, you know, uh, different forms of carceral violence against communities. So this is the Black Panther Party. Many of us are probably familiar with, you know, their 10 point platform um, and, you know, as you see, they address different issues regarding um, the criminal justice system, also military service, right, which is another form of violence work, right? And if you don't know, the Black Panther Party actually updated its 10-point platform to add wanting the government to give free health care to oppressed communities, right? Um, and so they're very much, you know, interested in health care. This is a book by Dr. Alondra Nelson. Um, body and soul, which looks at their fight against medical discrimination. And so they're building presence, right? And they're building presence in terms of kind of um, what um, Angela Davis has talked about the Black Panther Party's programs as a way of um, enacting some of the best principles, she said, of kind of abolition democracy from the era of post-emancipation, right? Um, Hannah, thank you. This is um, Huey Newton, and we can't read the whole thing, but one of the things I wanted to point out is that, you know, um, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, its origins are often associated with their um, anti-police brutality politics and that they were monitoring the police and having, you know, confrontations with the police, right? But Huey Newton also talked about what was some of the um, influence on him and why he decided to kind of start thinking really politically about stuff and looking for what he saw as political answers. And in Revolutionary Suicide, he actually talks a lot about debt. And he said, quote, unquote, the bills were the most profane words he could ever hear on the street. And he talked about what it was like to see his father um, just work so hard and always be behind on the bills and just to always have debt. And he talked about looking around um, uh, the black people that he grew up with and seeing the same thing. And he said, you know, the community was working hard. He goes, and yet they never seemed to kind of get out of debt and to never kind of get ahead. And he said that really pushed him to think politically about these issues, right? And so this is something that I just find really powerful when we're thinking about debt today, but it also shows that, you know, there is many kind of, um, I think, uh, political concerns along with policing, but also just, you know, stolen time and, you know, and the kind of constant stress around money, 
right? Um, that also influence kind of people even kind of looking for a political kind of uh, different um, uh, 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 world, right? Um, next slide, please. Okay, so this is Fred Hampton and um, Fred Hampton was, you know, um, uh, the Chicago um, and Chicago Black Panther Party, right? And one of the things is, is that he talked a lot about some of these programs, right? And one of the things is that he, you know, he talked about um, these programs as kind of building towards, right, a horizon of freedom. And, you know, um, he says, first you have free breakfast, then you have free medical care, then you have free bus rides, right? And so he's kind of saying, you know, what is it that we deserve? And also how do we kind of build, right, towards these things and also encourage communities to see these things as things that they rightfully deserve to have for free, right? Um, and so, you know, uh, you can read the slide here. But this is something I really appreciate too, is that Fred Hampton often gets talked about as kind of, you know, um, a multiracial figure. Like if you look at Jacobin, they're always kind of raising him up as this, you know, kind of multiracial hero. And I get that, right? But he constantly said in a lot of his speeches that, you know, the black political struggle for freedom was the vanguard struggle, right? Um, and he believed in a multiracial, you know, working class struggle. But he never kind of, you know, it wasn't at odds with him seeing the Black liberation struggle as the vanguard struggle to kind of really kind of, you know, push for. And this is something that I really love. He said about the People's Free Medical Clinic. And he said, why did we put it on the Chicago's West Side? And he said, because we know where the problem is at. We know that Black people are the most oppressed. Yet this clinic served everybody. And he said, the only prerequisite to receive free medical care is that you be sick. Right. And so it wasn't any of this bullshit around kind of, you know, uh, means tested or anything like that. Right. This is the world we want. Right. Um, next slide, please. So the young lords. Right. Now, um, this sign here on the right talks about the young lords protect and serve your people. Right. And I think that's very powerful just because, as you know, the uh, police get depicted as protect and serve, right? And part of what we're going to think about is, you know, what is the work of the police later on, right? Um, this is uh, the young lords with, um, you know, an x-ray. Um, they hijacked an x-ray truck because the x-ray truck wasn't going to certain neighborhoods and they weren't doing tuberculosis testing, right? Um, next slide, please. The reason I bring up the young lords and the social welfare state, especially given what's happened politically um, with the uh, um, you know, uh, leaked Supreme Court uh, document is that the young lords, um, they believe that there should be abortions, right? As part of you know, a social right, right? And they had a very expansive vision of kind of reproductive justice. They believe that um, abortion should be, you know, uh, that people should be able to have uh, medically sound, you know, safe, you know, um, abortions, right, that are legal. They believed in an uh, end to um, uh, testing on colonized people, um, you know, some of the birth control testing, so they're critical of that. They also believe that there should be birth control for everybody if they want it. But they also said that poor people should be allowed to have as many babies as they want and to have a strong social welfare state such as medical care, um, such as, you know, uh, uh, food assistance, and also um, a, a, a public um, child care services, right? And they said poor people should be able to have as many children as they want and to have a public system that, um, you know, allows those children to grow up healthy and so forth, right? And I just think that's such a powerful kind of reminder that, you know, abortion rights has been part of some, not everybody, the Black Panther Party wasn't into it, right? Um, they saw it as genocide, but abortion rights has been the agenda for some people as part of a public good, right? Um, next slide, please. So this is a national welfare rights organization. And one thing is, is that um, they were an organization that was, had a lot of black women's leadership. And the reason why that's kind of significant is, you know, today um, the majority of people who are on public assistance are white people, right? 
but historically, um, uh, you know, black people and were prevented from being on different forms of public assistance. And so it wasn't until about like the 1970s that you had, um, 1960s, 1970s, that you had, you know, a, a decent amount of black women who even got access to public assistance. And, you know, but despite kind of, you know, the racial imbalance of who even got access to public assistance, black women were um, some of the major leaders in this organization. It was a multiracial organization. One of the things that they called for was they called for a basic income, right? And that was influenced by kind of, you know, some of the wages for housework work, right? So when we're talking about, you know, some of the modern monetary kind of things, and some of us are thinking about things like, you know, a job guarantee and so forth. There's a long history in kind of certain feminist work, not at all feminist work, but also in um, welfare rights organizing, right, which sometimes was at odds with mainstream feminism, who didn't want to kind of claim poor women and women on welfare, right, um, that, you know, they fought for things like a guaranteed income, okay. Um, next slide, please. So this is Johnny Tillman, and I'm just, you know, I think her essay, Welfare is a Women's Issue, I recommend if you have not read it, to me it's some of the most uh, powerful theorizing. And it was published in uh, the 1970s in Ms. Magazine, and I've taught it in my Sociology of the Family class for years. And one thing she says is, she says, welfare is like a super sexist marriage. You trade in a man for the man, but you can't divorce him if he treats you bad. He can divorce you, of course, cut you off anytime he wants. But in that case, he keeps the kids, not you. The man runs everything. In ordinary marriage, sex is supposed to be for your husband. On AFDC, you're not supposed to have any sex at all. You give up all control of your own body. It's a condition of aid. You may even have to agree to get your tubes tied so you can never have more children just to avoid being cut off welfare. And so here, right, one of the things is Johnny Tillman is thinking about kind of the forms of social control that are associated with getting access to public assistance. And so today when we're thinking about issues around a non-punitive, non-carceral social welfare state, right? So we wanna, you know, when we're talking about defund and divest invest, right? Yes, we wanna invest in a strong social welfare state, but we want it to be non-carceral, right? And one of the ways that she actually started getting organized in, um, some of the work that she did, she was already a shop steward in her uh, union, right? So she already had some of that organizing experience. But what was happening was she lived in a housing project and these welfare officers would come and like bang on the women's doors demanding to know if they had a man there like at midnight, right? And basically what she's getting at is she's talking about the ways that, you know, um, a lack of sexual autonomy, a lack of bodily autonomy, all these things people are debating about abortion rights is connected to this stuff, right? And the control around kind of your relationships, your intimacy, who you could even hang out with, just so you could get public assistance, right? And so there's just, you know, I think this is a really important part of kind of some of what I see as some of the origins of thinking about kind of, you know, um, non-punitive, um, you know, uh, forms of public assistance in a non-punitive social welfare state. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're going to get into defund. And one of the things is, is that we often hear defund is kind of talking about, um, kind of talked about in this almost kind of divest invest, right? Like kind of, you know, take the money from one place and then invest it into another, right? And so what happens a lot of times is, you know, defund on one hand is a conversation about budgets. And it's a conversation about how is money spent. And budgets are more on political documents. So this is an important conversation for people to have, right? Where is this money going? One of the concerns I have, though, is that I feel like sometimes um, too much of the analysis, not by everybody, right, but too much of the analysis of defund gets into kind of this cost analysis, right, um, where it gets into kind of cost benefit. And so it's like, you know, compares programs cost against monetary estimates of its benefits, right? In some cases, it might get into a cost effectiveness analysis, right? So it's kind of, you know, will we have a desired goal? And we're not really thinking in economic terms, right? But part of it is, I don't think that we should kind of approach defund as only thinking about kind of, you know, where should the money go, right? Defund to me, and this is where we're going to get into these questions about like, what does it mean to think of defund as the political floor, 
um, and kind of a stepping stone to abolition, but it is not abolition itself. And that's something that people have been trying to clarify because a lot of people have kind of equated defund the police with abolition and is not necessarily one and the same, right? So can we get the next slide, please? Thank you. So I want to talk about kind of how are police funded, right? And um, and this is getting at kind of, you know, the cost of police, right? Um, and so there's a lot of different kind of, you know, uh, websites and so forth that you can look up where people are kind of estimating the cost of police. I would recommend organizations like the Action Center for Race and the Economy, Acre, right? Um, Vera Institute has done some of that work. You can decide if you want to go to Vera Institute to look up that work. Um, you know, but, you know, so there's all these kind of ways that people are trying to track how much money is, you know, and where the money comes from, right? So this comes from interrupting criminalizations um, thing. And this is a question about, you know, where does the money come from that the police are funded through? So it can include city and county budgets, state funds, federal grants, right? So for example, you know, um, you know, the Department of Justice has different grants that they, you know, kind of make. Um, fines and fees, we often hear a lot about that in terms of um, traffic stops, right, um, and, and the amount of kind of money that they've collected. Um, asset forfeiture, contracts and collaborations with private and public institutions, and corporate philanthropic and private donations. So that's where a lot of police funds come from on a kind of a general level, right? Can we get another, the next slide, please, right? There's also, you know, the issue of, you um, what is known as police brutality bonds. And this comes from ACRE, which I just mentioned. Um, and this is a report I highly recommend. I've taught it in my class. Um, I was teaching it a few years back, but they updated uh, the version of it. So, and they kind of updated it in the course of the political struggles of 2020. And what they're looking at is, you know, a lot of these issues are on settlements and judgments, right? And so you have these lawsuits that are brought against the city um, because of um, police violence or death by the police, right? Um, and so what is happening a lot of times is cities will use, well, they'll take out kind of, you know, they'll get these bonds, right, to try to cover the cost of it. But that money ends up um, you know, having to come from somewhere. So sometimes it's covered through kind of then taxes, right? Or, you know, money is shifted around and so forth. And so what, because police officers are often kind of protected um, as workers and they aren't the ones who are paying for these lawsuits, right? One of the things this report talks about is just the sheer amount of money then that's taken from cities that could be distributed elsewhere, right? Now, I want to point out though, and this is a very important point, right, is that we want to still support people who are bringing these lawsuits, because what has happened is sometimes cities, they will try to kind of create resentment towards the people bringing lawsuits. And sometimes they create like, you know, um, uh, like a tax or something, and they'll name it after the victim instead of the police officer who committed the violence. So people get mad at the victim. Right. Um, and so we want to support people with these lawsuits. Right. Part of the issue is why is it that the police even exist that we even have to pay these lawsuits. Right. Um, so this is a very important uh, project, but this is also another source, right? These bonds, right, that people take out, um, these cities take out, excuse me, that's also where um, some of the pain for the police uh, comes from. By the way, I just want to point out Alexandra Goodwin, Raul Carrillo, and I, as well as Chaz Arnett, um, we will be in conversation uh, May 25th to talk about um, surveillance and data and policing, but also people and organizations' efforts to kind of challenge data surveillance and so forth. Um, and Alexandra Goodwin um, has talked about the police as, quote unquote, the uh, um, muscle of racial capitalism, right? That's a phrase that she uh, developed, right? Um, next slide, please. Okay. But one of the things is Ruth Wilson Gilmore points out, you know, one of the things about the budget conversation that can be concerning is that if we only kind of think about what's in the available budget, and this is our build up to MMT, y'all, right? But if we only think about kind of what's in the available budget, we can sometimes narrow our scope of things. And we start maybe thinking about, you know, 
um, how much will it cost to actually have the services that we want, right? So if abolition is about presence, right? Well, we want things, right? And we want all the good things and we deserve all the good things. But if we just kind of think about kind of budgets only in a very narrow way, and we just say, well, what's available for police should be what's available for us. Not necessarily, right? It should be no police and we want it all. <laughs> it, and so it's like, you know, but we're, we're often kind of thinking about just as shuffling the money, right? One of the things that happens is, you know, I would say this, regardless of what the police are getting, right? Again, we want to kind of just have no police, but regardless of what the police are getting, right? We deserve to have our stuff funded, right? And so one of the things is, you know, Ruth Wilson Gilmore says no abolitionist who is true abolitionist is concerned about saving money, right? What we want is for the money to be spent, right? But on things that support and enhance human life, right? And so, you know, we want money to be spent in ways that does not facilitate premature death and that does not facilitate violence work, right? Or degradation of the economy, or the, the climate and so forth, right? But this is something that, you know, a lot of people, if they're kind of only thinking about cost benefit analysis or cost savings analysis or whatever, and they only stay, their political imagination only stays within what the budget tells them, right? This is something that we can kind of miss in these defund conversations. Next slide, please. Okay. So um, one of the things is, is that, um, this is from Interrupting Criminalization, which is a, a research and policy and advocacy organization by, uh, that was founded by Miriam Kaba and Andrea Ritchie. And one of the things they talk about is kind of funny math and fake wins. And one thing I'll say is that, you know, I don't think it's necessary to get mired down in the numbers sometimes. What I mean by that is, you know, whether it's crime data or budget data, sometimes people just get in these kind of, you know, I got a statistic versus your statistic, and then it just becomes kind of like these data conversations, right? But when do the numbers matter, right? Well, one of the things I think is useful about this uh, kit of theirs is that they're thinking about kind of, you know, when does the math matter, right? Well, part of it is you want to kind of know did you actually, you know, reduce the budget, right? But does that mean you necessarily reduce the workforce, right? You could reduce a budget, for example, by just getting rid of overtime, but you could still have the same number of police, right? Well, if part of abolition is getting rid of police, right, you're not going to just only focus on the overtime, right? Um, but it's also where they can kind of shift where the money comes from or what it covers or how it's also kind of labeled, right, um, in the city budgets. And this is one of the reasons why some of these organizations like Vera Institute or um, Acre, um, they do a lot of stuff about kind of where the hidden money is, right? Because not all of it is so transparent. And so one of the things that people have talked about on a level of organizing is that sometimes it's important to kind of think about the math in terms of, you know, progress politically, right? Well, if you know how many police officers a city has, you want to say by the end of this year, we want that workforce reduced down to this, right? That's when math kind of matters, right? Because it's about kind of working towards, right, abolition. Right. But if it's just about kind of like I got an interesting data point and here's a statistic and I got an interesting statistic, sometimes you're just kind of having a debate about kind of statistics and who's got the more interesting one. Right. But it might not really go anywhere politically. Right. In terms of actually shifting. Right. Kind of, you know, the balance of power. Right. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is, I think, you know, um, the slide that we had seen just before, that was the kind of, um, it was a revised version of this report. So this report comes out um, and defund the police, and this is uh, fund the people and defend black lives, right? And this is from interrupting criminalization. And then they had updated it with the kind of uh, report that you saw in the last slide, right? But this is an example of kind of what does it mean to think of defund as the floor and not as, you know, abolition itself, right? And so they talk about kind of, you know, that you want to think about kind of issues of budget cuts, but that budget cuts have to do with reductions in police power, scope of operation, size of force, number of police contacts, and legitimacy of practices, 
right? So this is not just a conversation about money. It's about what the money pays for, but it's also about just, you know, trying to reduce how many police officers there are. So that way we can have less interactions with police, right? Um, and so this is something where then it goes to defund the police. Then they're talking about dismantle, right? But to them, excuse me, the end goal is abolition, right? And so I encourage you, you can look up this report online and look at this in more in greater detail. But this is important because not all defund the police or divest invest kind of models operate with this, right? Some, you know, are fine with just kind of like, oh, we'll take the budget here and we'll take there, or we'll just reduce kind of, you know, um, uh, the size of the police force, we'll reduce the budget, but they're not necessarily interested in abolition. So it's important to kind of identify that there are different models out here. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're getting into modern monetary theory. This is Stephanie Kelton, and I just really like this picture, partly because it looks like she's pointing at her book and saying, read it if you haven't, right? Which we all should if we haven't. Um, and this is from her website, actually. So Dr. Kelton, um, she wrote the book, The Deficit Myth. And um, I highly recommend looking at it if you have not. Um, and we're gonna get into kind of some of the core um, insights that modern monetary theory helps us kind of understand about the US economy and about kind of the possibilities for our political demands, right? Next slide, please. So first, let's talk about what is fiscal policy versus monetary policy. So fiscal policy are actions taken by our elected representatives in Congress and the White House regarding government spending and taxation, which also involves the Department of Treasury, right? That differs from monetary policy, and monetary policy are actions taken by the nation's central bank, the Federal Reserve, right? Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a story that um, Dr. Kelton tells in her book that I think is really helpful for kind of um, illustrating this kind of difference between these two policies. So an appearance before the House Financial Services Committee, Chairman um, Powell, Jerome Powell, explained that the recovery will go faster if we have both tools, monetary and fiscal policy, continue to work. He understands that the, feds can't, that the Fed can't do what the Fed can't do. Reminding lawmakers of what the Fed can't do, Powell said, the Fed has lending powers, not spending powers. Unlike Congress, he explained, the Fed cannot grant money to particular beneficiaries. That's an important difference between monetary and fiscal policy. Only Congress can authorize the dispensation of a kind of helicopter money, the airless financial aid directly into the bank accounts of its targeted recipients. Okay, next slide, please. So this is the Federal Reserve System and it was founded by a Congressional Act in 1913. And then its stated goal was to make the US banking system more stable, right? So it's an agency um, in the federal government. One of the things though, is it often kind of acts independent on an ideological level, right? But, you know, Congress could, you know, actually kind of get rid of it. I mean, you know what I mean? So, um, but it has this kind of ideological independence. Um, and so, uh, and that's a, a created independence, obviously, that, you know, um, they want to have. And so this is how it's organized, right? Um, and so the so-called five key functions, right, are conducting the nation's monetary policy, helping maintain the stability of the financial system, supervising and regulating financial institutions, fostering payment settlement systems safely and efficiently, promoting consumer protection and community development. It sounds so nice, doesn't it? Right now, whether or not they actually live up to these things is a whole nother issue, okay? Um, next slide, please. Okay, so one of the things is, you know, I wanna kind of break apart two key parts of the deficit myth that I think are really helpful for thinking about abolition. Um, and so Stephanie Kelton says, you know, um, one is that she's reminding us that and modern monetary theory is reminding us that monetary sovereignty is a thing in certain countries, including in the United States, and that this is significant for helping us kind of move beyond the taxpayer frame, which we'll talk about in a moment, right? And so she talks about how, you know, there's this kind of myth that the federal government has to manage their budget like a household would, 
right? Do I have enough money for this? I can't buy this if I don't have enough money or I have to move my money around and so forth, right? And pay this bill and decide not to pay that bill, right? These are kind of the, you know, life decisions we often make um, around kind of our own finances, right? But she's saying, you know, part of it is countries with monetary sovereignty, they don't have to manage their budgets like a household would. And in her book, she talks about kind of the post Bretton Woods monetary system. And she says, you know, she points out we're no longer on a gold standard. And yet so much of our political discourse is still rooted in that outmoded way of thinking. And so she says, we see it every time a reporter asks a politician, where will we find the money to do that? And we can also think, you know, um, really quickly here, it's like, think about how many times we've heard politicians say, well, we don't have the money for that, right? And, and the federal government, you know, and co congressional people saying, we don't have the money for that, or kind of threatening us with having to raise taxes or so forth, right? Well, one of the things is, is that, you know, she points out, because we are an issuer of sovereign fiat currency, right, is that, you know, money is no object, literally or figuratively, right? And so, she points out, you know, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury and all that, right? Basically, they can, you know, print out money, right? Um, and so Raul Carrillo, he said this in a, a law review journal article, and I just really love this quote, partly because, you know, um, it has the NBA sports reference in it, right? But he says, the U.S. government can never run out of money in the same way that the NBA can never run out of points, right? And so what does it mean if, you know, the federal government can never run out of money? right? It means that they have the money when they want it. And it's not contingent necessarily on taxes, right? And so a lot of our critiques about kind of budget priorities are often, you know, with the federal government, we often use kind of tax discourse about it. And this is no shade, right? Um, this was a very important insight that MMT gave to me because I was doing that, right? But we'll often be like, oh, you know, our taxes go to the military instead of this. Department of Defense spending is not all coming from taxes, y'all. I mean, you know what I mean? The sheer amount of money, no, that is not, you know what I mean, right? But we often kind of uh, articulate our concerns that way. And so part of the question is, how do we hold on to our political concerns and our critiques that come from such a powerful place, but not limit our kind of ability to critique and to demand more of what we actually deserve, right? Next slide, please. So the next part of the deficit myth that um, uh, Dr. Kelton talks about is this, you know, kind of assumption that we rely on taxes. And this is, as I was saying, you know, a very powerful kind of myth, right? And a lot of leftists and people who are critical of the carceral state, critical of the military state, who'd like to see abolitionist presence, right? A lot of us use this framework. And I, and I really want to encourage more of us to kind of think about the political stakes of using this framework, right? And so she says, you know, Dr. Kelton says, the taxpayer, according to the conventional view, is at the center of the monetary universe because of the belief that the government has no money of its own. Therefore, the only money available to fund the government must ultimately come from people like us. Modern monetary theory radically changes our understanding by recognizing that as the currency issuer, the federal government itself, not the taxpayer, that finances all government expenditures. Taxes are important for other reasons, but the idea that taxes pay for what the government spends is pure fantasy. Next slide, please. So this is a really great article, and if you haven't read it, I would uh, encourage you to read it. It's in Splinter, right? And it's Raul Carrillo and Jesse Meyerson, The Dangerous Myth of Taxpayer Money. And one of the things that they point out is they say, you know, calling public money, right? So this is also where we want to think about what is often described as kind of, you know, um, government money is, is equated a lot of times with taxpayer money, right? But also, you know, it's public money, right? And, and when we rely too much on kind of this idea that, um, what we have paid for is from the taxpayer, right? Well, think about all the kind of hierarchies in terms of like tax paying, right? Um, in terms of people's incomes or salaries, right? Um, poor neighborhoods versus wealthier neighborhoods. And if you put the taxpayer in kind of the driver's seat, right? You're basically saying those with more wealth or who have more kind of wealth kind of, you know, say as a taxpayer, right? Um, they that they deserve to have more of a say in types of kind of the services and so forth, right? That's a very dangerous type of argument to make, right? 
And so one of the things that they talk about is they say, you know, um, you know, we kind of assume then that the economy is just built on kind of taxpayers, but not the contributions of debtors, workers, and countless other people. So you erase all these people from the economy in terms of kind of how the economy operates, right? And you basically give a lot of political power for kind of defining what our political imagination should be in terms of what we deserve to this so-called kind of taxpayer, right? Next slide, please. Now, we won't be able to get into all of this because, but this comes from their article, right? But also this is where they talk about kind of, you know, um, how the taxpayer frame doesn't reflect how public spending works, right? And so this is where they kind of talk about um, MMT theory um, and, and also talk about how to think about kind of public money, right? Um, and that this is something we are all part of the public. We all deserve to kind of, um, you know, uh, be involved in the conversation about money and how it's used, right? Um, no matter how much we each pay in taxes, right? So this is a very important intervention because one of the things that happens is again, our critique saying, oh, this is where our taxes go, right? We're still reifying this idea of kind of the taxpayer being in the political driver's seat, right? Well, what about all these people who don't pay taxes for whatever, you know, reasons? We're not talking about just the wealthy people. We're talking about people who might, you know, not have a job, right? Um, what about people who don't, you know, have large incomes, right? There's all these kind of politics involved when we kind of give so much power in, in, in the discourse to kind of the taxpayer. Next, please. And Raul, you know, I know you're being real modest right now, but go ahead and put your own, uh, you know, co-authored essay in the chat, please. <laughs> okay, so anyways, so this is uh, public money versus taxpayer frame. So this is Raul again, right? And this is from um, a panel that I uh, co-hosted and organized with Haymarket that featured uh, Raul, as well as Alexandra Goodwin, as well as um, uh, Reverend Delman Coates. Um, and also um, uh, Sean Sebastian, right? And that was called, thank you, Raul, for putting your essay in there. Um, and that was uh, called uh, Public Money and Racial Justice. And one of the things is, is that, you know, Raul uh, points out, and this is something I really appreciate, is he says, you know, um, it, when we kind of talk about public money as taxpayer money, and we kind of focus again too much on the taxpayer, he says we basically are kind of trapped in this idea that we need to go convince so-called honest white middle-class patriarchs in the suburbs that we deserve that money and that we can be good stewards of it, right? And so it's also kind of this, you know, um, way of reproducing, right? This kind of idea of a racial order and a class order of kind of, you know, who gets to control the resources and decide that the rest of us get to have access to them. And Raul Carrillo is obviously challenging that, right? And he says, you know, there are reasons to tax the wealthy, right? You know, and so um, he and uh, Jesse Meyerson point out and, you know, their splinter piece, it can be a way to challenge oligarchy, Right. It's also a way just to fuck with the wealthy and to let them know, like, you know what, you just can't, you know, kind of get away with shit. Right. So I understand that. Right. But this is something where we aren't actually reliant on taxing the wealthy for, you know, um, uh, public money. And that's an important distinction to make. Right. Next slide, please. So this is Carta Scott King. And this is, um, you know, uh, both uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Credit Scott King, um, they thought a lot about kind of issues of the economy and, you know, kind of divest and invest, right? If you think about Martin Luther King's um, critique of the Vietnam War, and he talks about kind of what does it mean to kind of fund war um, when you're not funding social services at home, right? Um, he also was somebody who promoted a job guarantee, and that was part of kind of his um, uh, uh, poor people's campaign and the Economic Bill of Rights. Um, but both he and Credit Scott King also thought about, and I think this is such an important part of it, it's not just about having guaranteed jobs, it's what type of jobs are you guaranteeing? We do not want guaranteed violence work. Right. 
Right now, the Department of Defense is the largest employer in the world and in the United States, right? That is violence work, okay? And so this is something where when we think about kind of the jobs that are being created or the jobs we're guaranteeing, right? I think both um, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Curtis Scott King, they really challenge us to also think about kind of the work that the work is doing, right? And so um, Curtis Scott King also did a lot of really important work uh, around the Federal Reserve, around fiscal and monetary policy. Um, the historian uh, David Stein has written a lot of really important work about that. Um, and so this is something that she said at, um, for a Mother's Day uh, speech. Um, and Mother's Day is coming up this week, so how, you know, appropriate, right? Um, but, you know, the message is always on time, right? So Congress passes laws which subsidize corporations, firms, oil companies, airlines, and houses for suburbia. But when they turn their attention to the poor, they suddenly become concerned about balancing the budget and cut back on funds. I must remind you that starving a child is violence. Neglecting school children is violence. Punishing a mother and her family is violence. Contempt for poverty is violence. Even the lack of willpower to help humanity is a sick and sinister form of violence, right? And so one of the things that she's pointing out here is that, you know, um, it's also about the political struggle about where are our priorities, where the money goes. So she's raising this critical perspective around so-called balanced budgets and deficits. And she's saying this is, you know, some smoke and mirrors, right? But it's also, you know, where are your priorities politically? Um, I just want to point out before we move to the next slide, I'd mentioned the, um, Dr. Reverend Delman Coates, um, and I, um, and Raul will put the link to the Haymarket um, uh, panel that we're all part of. He is um, uh, uh, someone who carries on the King's tradition. I say King's plural here on purpose, um, and also connects um, modern monetary theory to black liberation theology, and has done a lot of really important work with this organization, Our Money, and to think about kind of issues around racial justice and public money, right, in this kind of historical uh, vein. So next slide, please. Okay, so a couple of things, if we think about kind of political struggle, I want to kind of, you know, talk about a couple of these, right? So we have examples of where the federal government has recently kind of said, okay, we're going to kind of do some spending and to, you know, um, try to support, you know, uh, 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 local, you know, economies and so forth, right? But this is where kind of the issue of political struggle, right? Just because we get the money and just because the money is available to get, right? And that they make it available when they release the Kraken and gave it to us, right? It doesn't mean that we don't have to remain politically vigilant, vig vigilant, vigilant, right? And so part of it is what I'm trying to impress upon us is, yes, modern monetary theory raises, you know, kind of our understanding that the money can be made available. It's just that they want to, right? But then part of abolition is thinking about where does that money go and for what purpose, right? Um, and really having to clarify what we do not want funded, right? And what is the presence that we do want funded? So I wanna go through a couple of examples, right? So one of the things is, is that um, this was the CARES Act, Coronavirus Aid Relief and Econ Economic Security Act, right? Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So one of the things that happened was the CARES Act funding went a lot to police budgets, right? And um, in a range of cities. And so this was in, um, so 64% of its federal, you know, CARES Act money went to San Diego's um, policing, right? Um, and so the next slide, please. Okay. This also happened in Philadelphia, right? And so, one of the things I want to point out here is in the story, the, the relief was for, quote, unquote, public health and public safety, public health and public safety, right? And this is why we're going to talk about in the next thing, needing, we need to push back on kind of what is people's understanding of the role of the police, right? If you've already kind of associate policing with public safety, Right. Well, that sounds good on the surface, public safety. Who doesn't want that? Right. But it's like if you already associate, you know, culturally and ideologically with public safety. Right. It means, you know, we need to be more explicit. No, you're funding violence work. 
right? Um, and we're going to talk more about that next. But this is something that because, you know, this CARES Act had kind of more narrower terms, right, about kind of what could be funded, right? But nevertheless, what happened in some cities is they put more money into kind of the policing or prisons um, than they did into kind of public health measures in the midst of, you know, an ongoing pandemic, right? Um, next slide, please. This also happened in Chicago, right? Um, and so they use 60% on police, right? Um, next slide, please. Okay. So this has to do with the American Rescue Plan Act and this act wasn't as restrictive in some ways, um, but one of the things that happened was um, a lot of cities, and this is an article that was in the appeal, right? Um, and a lot of cities and states use that to basically, um, you know, uh, pay for policing and prisons, sometimes even try to restart kind of, you know, um, jails or prisons that were already kind of had been organized against um, staying open. And so this is something that, you know, um, you know, as it says here, the Alabama legislature passed a 1.3 billion prison construction package that include 400 million from the American Rescue Plan, five times the amount budgeted for hospitals, right? And so, you know, this is one of the risks, right? Yes, we might get the federal government to spend and to kind of give us money, right? But we have to be, you know, engaged in kind of local political struggles to say, we do not want the money spent this way. And you have organizers who are doing that, um, showing up to city council meetings, learning how to read budgets, right? Organizing against kind of, you know, these issues on multiple levels at a local level. And they're doing real heroes work here. Okay. Next slide, please. So this comes from interrupting, oh no, this comes from the police, the Cops Don't Stop Violence. It's a report called Cops Don't Stop Violence. And this is a report co-authored by Jared Knowles and Andrea Ritchie. And Andrea Ritchie, again, is one of the um, co-founders and, and um, uh, uh, people who are uh, with Interrupting Criminalization who co-authored the defunding uh, toolkit that we looked at, right? But this is something where they were talking about what should be prioritized, right? Not instead of policing and all this stuff, right? They were talking about all the things that we could have used this for. And I think this is important to kind of point out, right? Like what are the real struggles people are going through that that money could have been used for and to kind of expose the fact that elected officials in localities, right? Chose to use those funds for policing or prisons instead of, you know, some of this other stuff that could have been, you know, um, much more important, right? And so this is also what people are trying to push back on when we talk about public safety, right? We often think about public safety only in the language of crime. But what if we think about it in terms of kind of having a lot of our needs met, right? Reducing the likelihood, right? for kind of different forms of violence or harm that somebody might engage in when, you know, their needs aren't being met, right? It's not a catch-all for everything, but it does say that, you know, it could help, right, reduce kind of violence or harm that might be enacted because people's needs are being met, right? Next slide, please. Okay, so this is President Biden, and this is, you know, um, and uh, not too long ago in February, and he was meeting with uh, Mayor Adams in New York um, and, and other elected officials. And one of the things that he was talking about is just kind of, you know, how he wants to add more money. And he was talking about the answer is not to defund the police, but to give the tools, the training, and the partner, you know, and he says, so they can be protectors, right? And this is where we're going into kind of thinking about what is the work that police do? Because I think this is actually a really important point for kind of understanding kind of, you know, um, uh, abolitionist presence, right? Abolitionist presence is also a labor issue. If we want, you know, a strong social welfare state that is non-carceral, non-punitive, that's going to require people and a workforce, right? It's going to require kind of, you know, training and skills, right? Um, it's going to require people to get good salaries and also a lot of time 
for their own care, right? You know what I mean? So they're not overworked, right? In the way that a lot of times so-called care workers are, right? But it also means shifting how we encourage our uh, people to think about the function of the police. And this is where in this conversation about kind of abolition of labor, I want to think about how do people explain the function of police in society? Because even among people who want abolition, there are competing perspectives about how to explain the role of the police. And this often comes out in kind of our critiques of the police, right? So if we think about what happened with the subway shootings, the subway shooting um, in Brooklyn not too long ago, right? A lot of the critiques were things like, you know, oh, you know, the police weren't really there for safety or like how this person get away with it or this and that, right? And even though some of those people, they, you know, those critiques came from a good place trying to point out kind of, you know, um, you know, these issues, right? Um, it, it helps reify sometimes this idea that the police are actually there for public safety, right? And that idea that police are there for public safety is one of the largest, one of the most kind of vital pieces of propaganda, propaganda that helps promote police legitimacy. Right. So um, I want us to think through some of these issues in the next section around kind of abolition and labor. Next, please. OK, so this is a poster by Michael DeForge. Right. And um, I just want to say, you know, I was very uh, I, I found this poster really compelling. And part of it is because I think it's just very stylistically very powerful and also because I agree no cops in labor and no police unions. So I want to say, you know, I believe, you know, that this person who created this poster and I, I believe that we are on um, the same, um, I believe we're on the same team, right? Now this person might be like, bitch, no, we're not. And I'll be like, okay, you're right, right? But I do believe we're on the same team politically, okay? What I want to point out, though, is that this idea that cops aren't workers, that's something I've been kind of curious about for a while, right? Because this is a very kind of common statement among some leftists, cops aren't workers, right? I'm going to make a case that I actually think we need to kind of consider cops to be workers, and I'm going to talk about why in relationship to kind of abolitionist presence, right? Now, I just want to say real quick, I understand that, you know, cops are not on the side of the working class. They are, you know, as Alex Goodwin has said, the muscle of racial capitalism, right? They also, you know, obviously, particularly through their police unions, which really gained momentum and really, they started really fortifying their police unions in the um, wake of black rebellions in the 60s and the 70s, right? So I understand police unions give cops a range of protections that other workers do not get including some of the stuff that we talked about in terms of lawsuits against um, police officers, right? And I also understand that cops, you know, um, basically usually side against other workers and are used, um, again, as the muscle of racial capitalism and often an act of violence against work, other workers, right? So I understand all of the reasons why people say cops aren't workers, right? Um, but I want to kind of make a case for why I think it's important to think about it in some way, right? Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay. One is I want us to kind of think about the fact that police are public workers, right? Um, and I'm going to use, you know, New York City data here to talk about that. And some of you might be like, hey, lady, why are you talking about New York City? Don't you know that modern monetary theory is an internationally recognized theory and it's applicable to many cities, you know, many countries? Yes, I do, right? But New York City is, you know, the capital of capitals, they say, and also I have the data, okay? Now, one of the things I want us to talk about is uh, police as public workers using this data, right? So one is they just take up a large amount of kind of, you know, um, city budgets, right? So New York City fiscal 2022 preliminary budget, 92.3 billion, right? The police department's preliminary budget, right, 5.42 billion. Um, but that doesn't, you know, uh, talk about some of the other aspects of the budget, right? So it's the city's third largest agency. There are 52,000 NYPD um, uh, staff, right? And that accounts for one of every six city employees, right? Now, this 10.8 proposed budget it includes spending for fringe and miscellaneous benefits, pensions, and debt service. 
and it does not account for kind of legal settlements and awards. So again, you know, these lawsuits um, and, and so forth. And so in fiscal year 2020, the NYPD was responsible for 240.4 million lawsuit payments. And that was, you know, um, a little over a third of all the judgments against New York City and most of any agency, right? So one of the things that if we think about part of kind of defund to abolition, right? Part of defund to abolition is reducing the size of a police force because reducing the size of police force is getting rid of more people who have the force of the state to commit harm in the course of just doing their job, right? And so this is something that, you know, when we kind of say police aren't workers, one, you're just missing the fact that, no, a lot of them are on, you know, a payroll and that they're showing up to work and in doing that work, they're enacting violence, right? That that's part of their job, right? Um, and I think that it also is about reclaiming the public. What do we want the work of public work to be, right? Um, do we want it to be violence work, right? Or do we want it to be other work, right? It's also about saying, you know, we don't need police officers in general, but also police officers are often being, you know, um, sent to deal with kind of certain public issues. Right. So if you look at 311 data and New York City um, open data, they put their 311 data there. Right. Well, if you look at like a lot of the things that the police were sent to do, according to 311 data, it's stuff like people getting into arguments, loud music playing. Right. A car, you know, kind of, you know, uh, being parked in a certain area. Right. And so it also is, you know, there's a lot of stuff that could be seen as kind of public work that we don't need the police to be doing. Right. And so to me, it's about reclaiming the public and reclaiming the public in an abolitionist way. And to do that, we have to acknowledge this is what I see. We have to acknowledge politically that the police are public workers, whether we like it or not. Right. And we need to say we don't need violence work to be part of public work. Right. That's my argument. Right. And I think just saying they're not workers, we kind of don't deal with that reality, right? If we say that they're not workers, then when we're talking about numbers and reducing the size of the police force, we're talking about reducing not just policing in general, but reducing the number of workers who work in policing, right? And, and so forth. Um, next slide, please. So this is, you know, Violence Work is a book by uh, Nicole Siegel and um, very broadly, violence workers are understood as people whose work rests on the premise and promise of violence. Now, uh, Dr. Siegel does a lot of stuff regarding kind of, you know, how to think about violence work in relationship to the state and, and you know, and so forth. Um, and about, you know, the state being a legitimate arbiter of violence and different theories of violence in the state, right? I don't know if I totally agree with Dr. Siegel about how to kind of conceptualize the state. Um, because I don't always, you know, and so forth. But I do think that this is a very uh, powerful way to think about um, certain work as violence work. And one of the things that uh, Dr. Siegel points out is that not all violence workers are police officers or the military, right? You have other workers who do violence work, right? But he points out with the police, they can use the handcuffs, right? And they have just different power in being able to kind of do that violence work without you know, kind of uh, punishment or regulation, right, in certain ways. And so I think that I think it's useful to kind of talk about policing and military's violence work. Next slide, please. So this is Charlie Murphy. And Charlie Murphy, you know, I think is one of the best storytellers in, in the world. And even though we didn't focus on the military here, this is an example as someone who's talking about the work that they did as violence work, right? In a way that we very rarely see somebody who served in the military doing that. And, and they asked him, you know, what was it like being in the Navy? And he says, he talks about seeing, you know, the mushroom cloud over Beirut and they, you know, and um, it killed 247 US Marines right in this Beirut attacks, right? And he says, that's when it all came together for me. And I thought, this is not a high school fraternity. He said, you're part of a killing machine. And then he goes, you thought I was gonna tell you a joke or something? Right. And I thought, and you know, when I read this interview, I thought it was so powerful because I was like, very rarely do you hear people kind of publicly say, I was part of a killing machine. 
right? There's all this language of democracy or freedom or you know, public safety that is used to kind of conceal violence work, right? And so there's something just so you know, kind of you know, transparent to me about what he was saying, right? Next slide. And we only have a couple more slides, so don't you worry, everybody, okay? This is Miriam Cobb on what policing is. And one of the things is, you know, she talks about how violence is an inherent part of the police and policing. The police monopoly and use of force is not tangential or incidental, it is constitutive. That means we won't be able to exercise just the violence part of police violence while preserving the rest. Violence is central to police work, right? And I think this is really an important kind of uh, point. Again, it's consistent with this kind of understanding of certain work being violence work, right? And about why I think that getting, you know, dealing with the fact that police are workers whether we like it or not, right? And the reason being is one, I don't think we should fetishize work. Work itself isn't inherently good or moral, right? Um, that's like some industrial yeoman type of claim and being an artisan, and all that good stuff, right? So it's not inherently moral or good, right? But also, you know, violence work, that language just kind of puts into sharper focus what is the function of the police? And also pushes back against this discourse of the police as public safety, which again is a major form of propaganda, right? Next slide, please. So this is the last slide. And you know, we hear a lot about kind of issues of care work and the economy, but you know, a lot of times when people are talking about care work, there's two ways they're talking about. It. Sometimes they're talking about kind of um, care work in terms of certain like things like domestic work, nursing, teaching, and industries that have often been kind of paid industries that get associated with kind of care work. And if historically been gendered in a particular way, gendered where it's been often men of color, right? Um, and also has been gendered as, you know, women of all races, right? And, you know, but you also have this discourse of care work going on in a care economy in terms of kind of mutual aid and in terms of trying to change how we relate to each other um, and how we support each other um, as a form of abolition um, and as a way to try to challenge the carceral state, right? One of the things I would say is that I think that I would like to see more conversations about the labor politics of care work. One, because care work has often been a euphemism for being overworked and underpaid, right? Um, and, you know, and there's a lot of research showing that care workers in kind of certain industries are overworked and overburdened. We're seeing this a lot with like nurses, you know, kind of quitting and teachers quitting and so forth, right? But I've also been curious about this idea of kind of the labor politics of care, where a lot of the examples we give is kind of knowing your neighbor, having your pod, or kind of your community, right? But when we think about kind of a strong social welfare state, right, part of, part of the benefits of a strong social welfare state is, frankly, you shouldn't have to have children, a neighbor, or a friend to get basic human services, right? This requires labor, right? You shouldn't have to know your neighbors to be able to get, you know, kind of health care or to be able to get fed, right? You shouldn't have to, you know, have a child to kind of, you know, uh, you know, help you with housing when you get old, right? Um, you should be able to be as, you know, kind of misanthropic as you want, right? <laughs> or alone as you want and still have a strong social welfare state to meet your basic needs, right? Um, and that is going to require a care economy on a different level than kind of our, you know, just immediate relationships or our pods, right? It's also going to, you know, require labor and money, right? And so this is where, what are we funding and presence, right? So I'll just say, for me, a care work and a care economy is where basic human needs are met, and we can draw from some of the examples, right? Also that utilities are free and well-managed, right? We don't wanna be drinking bad water for free, right? We want good water for free, right? Um, it's also about where support is provided. And so Aijin Pu and Sarita Gupta have talked about kind of policies for a care force, right? A lot of times we're doing a lot of unpaid caregiving and you know it's taking its toll emotionally and physically on a lot of people, even as much as we might love somebody and feel obligated, right? And, and wanna be there for them, right? So what are kind of forms of support that can be paid for, trained, and also those supporters care for, right? Um, I also think about care work as an economy that is about less stolen time, 
So much of our time is just stolen trying to kind of meet our basic needs and trying to work and all this stuff, trying to, and worried and stressed and everything, right? And less premature death, right? It's also about non-punitive forms of support and services. So social work, addiction support groups and services, and mental health services, they're not tethered to the carceral state or to the risk of punishment through the carceral state, right? And it's also recognizing that violence, harm, and abuse does happen and that people need help um, both um, dealing with their violence or abusive tendencies and that the survivors need a lot of support and help, right? In terms of survival, right? And so how do we have, you know, uh, services and support um, that is non-punitive and non-carceral, right? These are all questions about abolition, but these are also questions about money, right? And so we're gonna close out there. Thank you so much for um, uh, uh, tuning in tonight. Thank you so much again to Hannah, uh, Judson and Ashley Burke, and thank you so much to all of you for putting up with some of our tech issues. I have to say, Hannah and Ashley, you uh, work, you dealt with it like a pro, so thank you so much for uh, doing that, and Hannah, thank you for doing the slides. All right, everybody, thank you. Um, I hope you have a wonderful night, okay, and a wonderful weekend, and thank you so much for spending your Friday night with us, okay? All right, everybody, good night.